<clears throat> Father, we come before you this morning asking God that you would teach us your word. Lord, as Jesus asks and questions these Jews and these Pharisees here, Lord, help us to not be disconnected from his interrogation. Help us to not, not fail to recognize that we are asked the same question. How will we die? How will we die? Will we die in our sins or will we die in Christ? Please give us ears to hear this morning that your gospel would not fall on deaf ears and blind eyes and hardened hearts. That we would hear exactly what you would have to speak to us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, please be seated. So that's the question that this text is asking this morning as I looked at it this week. It's asking, how will you die? And if you look, you can see that Jesus is placing eternity in our view, he emphatically, three times, says to the Jews, You will die in your sin. You would die in your sins. You will die in your sins. Three times he says that. When the scripture repeats itself, that's how we know what God wants to say to us. You and I only have a fixed number of days before we Stand before the judgment seat of God. How will we die? And this pronouncement by Jesus in this text is unspeakably terrifying. There's no greater terror on planet Earth in the universe conceivable than to die in one's own sin and to stand before a holy God. Puritan Ralph Venning argued that nothing is so evil as sin. And he says that sin is worse than death, sin is worse than the devil, and sin is worse than hell. This is how he argues. He says, first, sin is worse than death itself. Because although death separates our soul from our body, it cannot separate us from the love of Christ like unforgiven sin can. This is one of the greatest comforts in Romans 8. Paul says, For I am sure that neither death nor life can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. But sin, unforgiven sin, will separate us from God for all eternity. So sin is worse than death. But he goes on, he says, sin is worse than the devil. The devil is our fiercest enemy. But do you realize that he needs sin to hurt us ultimately? But sin doesn't need the devil. We don't need the devil to sin. James tells us that if we resist the devil, he will flee from us. But while we're here in this state, sin is ever with us. Isn't that one of the heart aches of our life. Romans 7, things I don't want to do, I do. The things I do want to do, I don't do. Sin is always with us. The devil's not. So sin is worse than the devil. But sin is also worse than hell itself. The crime of sin is worse than its punishment. And the fact that hell is everlasting should make this very plain to us. There isn't enough time in the universe to punish sin. Sin is worse than hell. There's nothing in all of creation that can cure us from sin. That's why these words of Jesus are so penetrating this morning. How will you die? It took the death of the Son of God to cure your sin. When was the last time you just let that hit you? It took the death of the Son of God to make you right to stand before Him. This is a trustworthy saying. And 
deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am foremost. There's nothing in all of creation that can cure your sin problem. No amount of good works, no amount of money, no amount of knowledge, no amount of friends, not a good family, nothing, no exceptions. That's what Jesus is pressing in our passage this morning. Unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. So we're going to see this played out in two parts in our passage. First, we're going to see the ruin of dying in your sins. The ruin of dying in your sins. We're going to see the marks and characteristics of unbelief. And then secondly, we're going to see the remedy of dying in Christ. How Christ willingly laid down his life for sinners. And the only condition that he places upon a sinner is faith, is belief. So the ruin of dying in your sins and the remedy of dying in Christ. And here is our doctrine. If you don't get anything else out of today's message, just get this. Everyone will die. Only those who die in Christ will escape eternal ruin. Everyone will die. Everyone in this room is going to die. And only those who die in Christ will escape eternal ruin. So let's go to our first part, the ruin of dying in your sins. Now this conversation that Jesus is having with the Pharisees, it's a continuation of where Jesus started in verse 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And, and immediately the Jews went on offense against Jesus and Jesus had to defend what he was saying. But now Jesus is going on the offensive and he's pressing his doctrine into them now. And he says in verse 21, I'm going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. Now if you look, there's a difference between verse 21 and verse 24. In verse 21, Jesus says, you will die in your sin, singular. And then when he gets to verse 24, he changes it to the plural. You'll die in your sins. So what's going on here? Well, the sin here in view in verse 21 is unbelief. That's what the Jews and the Pharisees have been rejecting. They were rejecting Jesus. We don't believe. And so Jesus says, you'll die in that sin. Like most of the world today, these Pharisees were rejecting Jesus as the only Savior of the world. And this is important to point out the nature of unbelief. Unbelief is the damning sin. Unbelief is the damning sin because it's a sin against the remedy. If you sin against your only remedy, that's a damning sin. That's what... Christ is addressing in these Jews the damning sin of unbelief. So what we're going to do in this first section is we're going to consider the characteristics of unbelief that Jesus lays out. So characteristic number one of unbelief. Unbelief seeks other forms of deliverance. Unbelief seeks other forms of deliverance. Jesus says in verse 21, I'm going away. And you will seek me. Where I am going, you cannot come. What does Jesus mean here by you will seek me? At that point when I go away, then you will seek me. Well, I, I don't believe at all that he means that they would actually seek him. Because he says you won't find me. Where I'm going, you cannot come. We know that Jesus already told us in the gospel that whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Jesus is a welcoming Savior. All who groan to him, Jesus will answer but here he says, you will seek me, and that type of seeking you won't find me. So what does he mean? Well, he's saying that there's still going to be seeking another Messiah, another deliverer. The Jews today, are they not still seeking the Messiah? They are. But they reject Christ. They refuse to come to Jesus. Why? Because the main thing that Jesus tells them they need to be delivered from is their own sin. The main thing that they need to be delivered from is their own sin. The Jews had bought the lie that their main problem was Roman occupation. 
And don't we do the same thing? We buy into a, a different problem. Our main problem is world hunger, politics, whatever. Whatever is the latest thing on the news. And the Jews bought into this lie that the main problem was Roman occupation or a famine or opposing religious political parties or the Gentiles. And they wanted a Messiah that would deliver them from those things. And here Jesus comes along and says, no, the main problem is you. You're the main problem. Your main problem is not Caesar. Your main problem looks at you in the mirror every day. And dear congregation, you are your main problem in this world. Amen. You are your main problem. And I am my main problem. They're, they're, they're not things out there. They're right here. Your main enemy goes to bed with you every night. And I don't mean your spouse if you're married. <laughs> Just in case. The main problem is you. And if that's not what you believe, then you're agreeing with the Pharisees. You're agreeing with the Pharisees. And you will seek for a solution outside of Jesus for your problems. That's what we do. That's what we do. We're wired. That's why the Lord's Day is every seven days. Because it takes about six days for us to unwire the gospel that we heard from last week. So that's characteristic number one. Characteristic number two, unbelief is self-righteous. Unbelief is self-righteous. Verse 22. So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Since he says, where I am going, you cannot come. The historian Josephus reports that the Jews believed in this period of time that anybody who committed suicide would go down to the darkest places of Hades. That's important to understand here because the way that they respond to Jesus. Basically, they're reasoning like this. Well, Jesus must be speaking of suicide when he says, where I'm going, you cannot go. Because hell is the only place that we can't go. Because we're on God's side. Teeming with self-righteousness. Unbelief, that's what unbelief is, is teeming with self-righteousness. They rejected Christ because they believed that on the performance of their fasting and their tithing and their observing their feasts and festivals and offering up sacrifices, that they were acceptable before God. Unbelievers, this is their main problem. They're teeming with the thought that they are good. Or at least their good deeds have outweighed the bad deeds of their life. And the gospel demands something different. The gospel demands that we would beat our breast and cry out, Oh God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Your best works are glorious sins. That's the meaning of all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Your best deeds are glorious sins. Is that what you're going to bring before God? Dear congregation, we're not immune to this type of self-righteousness. Unfortunately, we don't shed it when we become believers. And self-righteousness is so attractive. Why? How would you answer that sentence? Why is self-righteousness so attractive? Because it allows you Consider yourself better than others. Jesus, in the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, when he gives that parable, Luke gives us a little commentary right before Jesus gives it. And he says this, Jesus told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. That's a sign of self-righteousness. How do you treat others in your heart? Secretly, the, the, the thoughts that nobody knows about. Children, how do you treat other children? Do you exclude them from your circles because you think that they are less cool than you? Adults, are there persons in your life that you purposely avoid? And if so, why? Why? Is that how you would want Christ to treat you? 
These things are anathema to the gospel. This is the self-righteousness that was flowing out of the hearts of these Pharisees and these Jews. Characteristic number three. Unbelief is worldly. Unbelief is worldly. Look at verse 23. He said to them, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. So Jesus, as he continues to press his prosecution here, we shouldn't think that he's talking just about location when he says, I am not of this world and you are of this world. He's pointing out the fact that unbelievers only reason from their carnal minds, their carnal, fleshly, worldly minds. On the other hand, Jesus, when he says, I'm not of this world, he's saying, I'm completely above worldly pursuits. Do you realize how free Jesus' mind was to worship God? He wasn't focused on money. He wasn't focused on bodily comforts. He wasn't aiming at the praise of men. He was completely given over to the will of his Father. How much freedom is there to live like that? But the Jews, on the other hand, they practiced, though they practiced an outward religion, they were completely worldly. They were just like the Romans, except for their outward form looked differently. Jesus already spoke on this as a major stumbling block of belief. We saw this in chapter 5. Listen very carefully to what Jesus says. John 5, 44. How can you believe when you receive glory from another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? How can you believe? In other words, you can't believe when your mind is focused on getting glory out there. You can't believe. And Jesus just says, that's, that's why you won't believe in me. Because you're worldly. Your congregation, worldliness is attractive because it wins the approval of others. And it's always, always seeping into the church. Let us not be deceived. Paul told the church in Corinth, he told this to a church whom he loved, whom he gave spiritual birth to. He said this to him, he says, you are still in the flesh. For a while there is jealousy and strife among you. Are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? Ask yourself, is there jealousy and strife in this congregation? If so, Jesus is saying through the Apostle Paul, you're still of the flesh. You're worldly. We're worldly. Dear congregation, was the Corinthian church the only church that struggled with worldliness? Examine your heart. If, if you are not at all content, if you are not at all content with your communion with God, is it possible that you are worldly? Is it possible that you're chasing after the things of the world? What's the center of your spiritual solar system? Characteristic number four. Unbelief is blindness. Unbelief is blindness. Skipping ahead to verse 25. The Jews asked Jesus, who are you? Who are you? Jesus said to them, just what I've been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say to you, much to say about you, and much to judge. The Jews were blind to the Messiah. Who are you? They didn't even know. Here was the hope of the entire Old Testament standing before them. They didn't even know him. When he says, this is what I've been telling you from the beginning, he means from Genesis 1. There's my profile. There's who I am. Don't you recognize who I am? That's what unbelief does. It makes you blind to reality. And he says in verse 27, they were also blind to God the Father. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. Blindness to the gospel is a willful thing and a divine judicial thing. We are willingly blind to the gospel and that, and that makes it a judicial blindness from God. Unbelievers ignore and refuse to look at their only remedies for sin. And so what does God do? God hands them over to blindness. We've already seen this in John chapter 3, verse 19. This is the judgment that light is coming to the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. This is the judgment. What's the judgment? Light has come, and what are people doing? They're loving the darkness. 
Judicial blindness. Loving darkness makes us blind to Jesus. And there's a good illustration of this in the Old Testament. Remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. When Lot was in the city and the angels came in to usher him out. And the angels struck all the people with blindness. And they were so blind they couldn't grope around. They couldn't find the door. They couldn't find the door. That's what blindness does. You can't find the door of life. You can't find Christ. You're completely blind to it. That's what was happening with these Jews. Unless the Spirit of God sovereignly grants faith and repentance in the new birth, this blindness will result in death. Characteristic number five. <clears throat> And this is the last characteristic. Unbelief seals all other sins to the soul and brings eternal ruin. Unbelief seals all other sins to the soul and brings eternal ruin. When Jesus moves from the singular to the plural, from sin in verse 21 to sins in verse 24, he's indicating that unbelief is what seals the soul in damnation. Look at verse 24. I told you that you would die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. Unbelief seals the soul in eternal condemnation irrevocably. Mark chapter 6, 16, verse 16. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. John chapter 3 verse 18. Whoever does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only Son of God. John chapter 3 verse 36. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. You see, brothers and sisters, unbelief drives the sinner away from Christ. It's not that unbelief only will be punished. There are millions of people from since the beginning of the world that have never heard of the gospel and they'll be punished because of their sin against the light that they receive. But the point here is that unbelief deprives the sinner of the only light of the world, Christ. Unbelief cuts you off against the remedy. And for that reason, it's the most diabolical of sins. Not only does it cut you off from the remedy, but it calls Christ a liar. God sent His Son into the world to be salvation for the world. And un the unbeliever says, you're a liar, God. <coughs> and so Jesus is threatening hell in these verses. When He says, you'll die in your sins, He says, that means hell. Those who reject the light of the world end up in outer darkness. Jude calls it the gloom of utter darkness that has been reserved forever. Because unbelief makes you an enemy of the living God. Can you think of anything more horrifying than that? We are often scared in life because our enemies would slander us or work against us in our jobs or fear in a in a poor country, seek your own life. But here, to become an enemy of the living God, there's nothing more terrifying. And that's what unbelief makes you. It makes you an enemy of the living God. Now let's look at the remedy of dying in Christ. The remedy of dying in Christ. We're going to see four elements that Christ brings as a remedy. First, we're going to see that Jesus offers himself willingly. Second, that Jesus' enemies will know that he is the remedy. Third, the Father is pleased to have Jesus be the remedy. And then fourth, faith is the only condition for this remedy. So first, Jesus willingly offers himself as a remedy. Look again at verse 21. Jesus says, I am going away. That's a, that's a little verse, but it's important. Jesus just got done, well, John just got done saying in verse 20 that Jesus' hour had not yet come. And now Jesus is saying that his hour is coming soon and he's going away. He's going away willingly. Meaning, Jesus had death in view from moment number one. 
just did that membership interview with Vince and Heather and it was so refreshing in the office, you know, this is not the view of, of much of evangelicalism. Much of evangelicalism teaches that Jesus is plan B, that God created all things good in the beginning and then man screwed it up and then God had to change his plans and send his Savior into the world. That is not the message of the scriptures. Jesus was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world. He desired to have Jesus put on display. And now Jesus is saying, I'm going to that task. And if Jesus wasn't willing, who could be saved? Who can crucify the Son of God? You realize how foolish that is? That the cross was some sort of accident that man somehow imposed their will on the Son of God? Do you realize that when the men came to arrest Jesus in John chapter 18, what happened when Jesus opened his mouth? They all fell backwards. And those men are going to subdue the Son of Man and nail his hands to a Roman cross? Jesus had to go willingly. And that's what he's telling us here. That's the first remedy, that Jesus went willingly to the cross. Secondly, Jesus' enemies know that he is the remedy. Jesus' enemies know that he is the remedy. Look at verse 28. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. And that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. When Christ was crucified, and He was held up and exalted on the cross, that became the ultimate convincer of these Jews. Now, Jesus didn't mean that all of them would believe or all of them would be converted, but they would all be convinced that Jesus was the Messiah and that he was sent from the Father. There's a big difference between being convinced and believing the gospel. And you must get this in your mind. If you are just convinced that the gospel is true or convinced that the Bible is true, that does not necessarily equate to salvation. The demons believe that. The demons believe in John 3.16. The demons believe in the Bible better than you do and better than I do. But the cross would serve to convince the world that Jesus was who he says he is. And whether this happens at the time of Jesus on the cross or at the end of time, it matters little. All the universe will bow the knee to Christ and confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is what Paul says. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All this distraction that we exist in right now. You turn on the nightly news and it's all about everything else other than God. That's going away soon. Everything is going to be about Jesus. The whole universe is going to be exclaiming His name. Thirdly, God the Father is pleased to send Christ as a remedy. God the Father is pleased to send Christ as a remedy. Verse 29, Jesus says, And He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to Him. Everything that Jesus did on planet Earth was exactly what the Father wanted Him to do. God was pleased that Jesus would bring salvation to blind, self-righteous, worldly sinners like you and me. He was pleased to have His Son do that. God was pleased to bring salvation, that Jesus would bring salvation to prostitutes and tax collectors and murderers. God was pleased that Jesus would bring salvation Salvation to his enemies. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. But God shows his love for us. In that while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Isaiah 53 10 says that it pleased the Lord to crush him. God was pleased to crush Jesus. But he wasn't pleased to have all mankind suffer under the wrath of God. Can you even conceive of that? God, if, if you're saved today. 
God wasn't pleased to have you be destroyed. But he was pleased to have Christ destroyed in your stead. That's the gospel. Number four. Jesus makes belief the only condition for this remedy. Calvin rightly says that as soon as a sinner groans for Christ, that Christ is ready to assist him. Jesus is not waiting for sinners to get better in order to save them. Because we can't. If if that's the gospel you're believing, you're believing a false gospel. He's not waiting for you to get better, to save you. He's waiting for you to groan to Him. That's the only condition to be saved is to believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Acts 16.31 Jesus said in 5.24, John 5.24 Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes Him who sent me has eternal life. He doesn't come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. John 20, 31, these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. (coughs) Saving faith is surrender to Jesus Christ. Jesus, take it all. I'm not righteous. I'm wicked. I am a worldly blind man and I have no hope of deliverance in anyone else. I surrender. I groan for you. I am yours. Save me. That's what saving faith is. And that's the very thing that these unbelievers refused to. To do. They refuse to give up the hope of their own salvation. They refuse to give up seeking another deliverer. They refuse to give up their blindness. They refuse to give up their worldliness. But it's belief alone that saves. And properly speaking, it's actually not even belief that saves us. It's Christ. Belief is just the instrument that brings us into union with Him. It's what connects us to Christ. Our belief our belief, if, our, if our salvation rested entirely upon our belief, we would be damned as well. Is your belief sincere enough? Is your belief strong enough? Is your belief pristine enough? Mine's not. I have a weak little mustard seed of faith, but I have a great big Savior that that faith is connected to. And that's what saves us. Who we're connected to. That's what these Jews were refusing to do. They were refusing to connect themselves to Christ. So let me return to our question that we opened up with. How will you die? How will you die? Let us not be so naive to believe that everyone here is in union with Jesus Christ. The church is full of wheat and tares. I plead with you to consider Jesus' words. Unless you believe that I am He, unless you believe that I am your only hope of rescue, You will die in your sins. How will you die, dear congregation? Will you die in Christ or will you die in your sins? So let's apply this to our lives. Turn to our doctrine. Everyone will die and only those who die in Christ will escape eternal ruin. Now, For those of us who have been Christians for a long time, we might hear a message like this and and deceive ourselves into thinking that since I've already already believed, since I already understand the gospel, that this message is really for the unbelievers in the room. It's not really for me. Let's consider again the state of Jesus' audience. These were Jews. They were at the Feast of Booths. The most highly religious people on the planet at a festival in Jerusalem. And so, let's consider how they are actually very much like you. They were religious. So are you. They believed that salvation came from the Lord. Just like you. 
They were devoted. They spent money and resources in getting there. Just like you do in your religious activities. They were anticipating the prophet to come. You anticipate a, a greater coming. But they missed Jesus. How did they miss Jesus? How did these religious people miss the Lord whom they believed had delivered them? Consider for a moment how the Feast of Booths was supposed to affect their souls. Every year for seven days they would replay God's delivering them from Egypt. How would they replay this? They would build booths and stay in them. They would have this water pouring ceremony. They would have this light. They would have this lamp lighting ceremony. It was to be celebrated and proclaimed. And Leviticus 23, 37 and verse 41 shows us this is what God ordained for them. He says, these are the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as times of holy convocation. You shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in a year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. What does this have to do with anything? Well, this is what it has to do with. These celebrations were to be perpetual. They were to be remembered every year that deliverance was from the Lord. Deliverance was from the Lord. Deliverance from their own ruin was from the Lord. But the problem was is that they began to view their deliverance as a means to another end rather than the end of their need. Or to put it in our vernacular, they started to view the gospel as the starting point of their spiritual life rather than the substance of their spiritual life. Let me say that again. They started to view the gospel as the starting point rather than the substance of life. They began to move to the higher things of religion and they put the gospel behind them. But the Feast of Booths was meant to remind them every time they came back to Jerusalem that they needed to remain in their Redeemer. Why do we need to hear the gospel again? Because we need to remain in our Redeemer continually. Christ is not a means to another end. He is the end. And brothers and sisters, if you ever graduate from Christ, whatever that means, then I promise you, you're going to adopt all the characteristics of these Jews. You will become self-righteous. You will become worldly. You will become blind. You will seek after other remedies for what ails you as opposed to going to Christ. This is the story of the, how the church falls away. Go to any church that's in decay, a church of Laodicea, and what have they done? They've gone away from the gospel as the solution to every one of their problems. And they start substituting in other things. Brothers and sisters, whatever problem that you're facing this week or this last week, you know what the answer is? The gospel. Christ slain for you. Christ emptied his blood out for you. Christ covered you in his righteousness. That's the answer of what you don't understand. Pastor, my problems are bigger. Bigger than what? The gospel of Jesus Christ, the most important historical event in the history of the world. The thing that defines all of the universe. God wasn't mistaken when he gives us messages like this. This is for the church. Remind us of what we've been saved from and who we've been saved by. Let's go to our duty. Our duty is that we are to rejoice that our name is written in heaven. Jesus constantly pointed back to the gospel whenever he sensed that his disciples were moving away from the center of it. Even when he sent them on mission. In, on one occasion, if you recall, Jesus sent out 72 disciples to preach the gospel in Luke chapter 10. And they had great success. And this is what it says in Luke chapter 10, verse 17 through 20. The 72 returned with joy. That's key. 
saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. You see what's going on there. Jesus is acknowledging that they have all this power at their fingertips. And he's saying, I know, and I've given you authority, and I've done this, and I've done this. But don't rejoice in those things. Rejoice that your name is written in heaven. What is Jesus doing? He's preventing us from rooting our joy in any other thing than the gospel. Brothers and sisters, this is part of the reason why we become discouraged in life. Because we root our joy in other things other than the gospel. My job. Oh, my job, my job, my job. And then your job fails you. Where was your joy rooted at? Where was your identity at? My health. And I, and I don't want to be insensitive. I know that there are people suffering in this body who have terrible health right now. But if your joy is rooted in your health, your joy is too superficial. You're going to die. And so am I. Your name is written in heaven. Nobody can take that away from you. It's written in the blood of Jesus. Where do we root our joy? Where do we root our joy? Lastly, our delight. Our delight is that he has not left us alone. Look again at verse 29. Jesus said, And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. Jesus is speaking this about himself, but when we are united to Christ, this promise becomes ours. Because we are Christ's own body. We are Christ's own bride. Dear congregation, all of us will die. There are tragic reports of death all around us. I don't know if you heard about that young two-year-old boy who was eaten by an alligator in Florida this week and the shooting the week before. And death is going to continue to pile up all around us. And some of us are closer to death than others. But if you are in Christ, then this statement that Jesus makes about himself applies to you. The Father is with you. The Father has not left you alone. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 through 6 says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? If you're in Christ, Father has said he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. There's no greater delight than that. Amen. I know some of you, and, 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 and I would even say myself, is, are suffering from a darkness of the soul right now. A depression, a, a, a blanket of despair even. What will get you out of that? What will, what will stop you from losing your mind? This promise. That God has not left you alone. Father has not left you alone. And you'll be able to look death in the eye and say, Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? God has not left you alone to die in the grave. God has not left you alone to your own devices. He's with you. This is what Christ accomplished for us, and it's the answer to the question, how will you die? You'll not die alone if Christ is with you. There's no greater comfort on a deathbed than that. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. 
It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's close in prayer.